So, first of all, I really apologise for being late. I made a special trip to the Midlands last night in order to get here on time. And then I discovered that in the Midlands they have slippery rails. So I'm afraid the trains were all delay delayed, so I do apologise about that. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for having me. And I suppose I can add my welcome in terms of... Um, thanking anybody that tries to come into the intersection between public health and WASH. Uh, I'm a public health engineer. I spend my whole life at the intersection between public health and WASH programming. So I think it's really exciting that there's more and more people who are trying to understand how, how these two sort of uh, communities, if you like, can work together. And one of the reasons why this is interesting is because I think we all know everybody understands, and obviously everybody in this room understands that there's a very strong connection between water sanitation and hygiene interventions and the management and reduction and hopefully elimination of tropical diseases of various kinds, including the neglected ones. So I was trying to think, what do I say to you? Because basically you guys know an awful lot, and it's always scary talking to people that know an awful lot. I'm much happier talking to seven-year-olds in primary schools, but... And I'm going to really try hard not to talk to you guys like your seven-year-olds in primary school. So I was trying to think, so what do we need to do as communities um, to get more people into this room, basically? How do we get more people from the WASH sector to pay attention to public health? And how do we get more people from public health or health to pay attention to the WASH sector as a whole, what I would call public health engineering? So I thought about... Um, giving some advice, really, for the two communities about what we need to keep banging on about, essentially. So I was thinking, OK, if you're interested in sanitation and NTDs, let's think about these two communities of people. And I know all of us are sort of essentially straddling them, so I'm not trying to put you all into little boxes, but I'm kind of trying to help you to encourage your colleagues to get out of their little boxes, if you like. Um, so I've been thinking a little bit about getting people to ask the right question. So here's the message that I think we need to give to wash people. And the message we have to give to wash people is, please ask, before you implement your wash program, what is the public health problem that you're trying to solve? I, I feel a little bit these days that the world is full of wash people who have a solution, roaming the world, applying their solution. And, you know, we, we know the very extreme cases of that. We know the world is full of, you know, very earnest, usually older, usually white, usually slightly plump men who really want to build sewer systems and activated sludge treatment plants. But we also know the world is full of incredibly earnest, often female, quite often wearing ethnic clothing, uh, earnest sort of keen people who would like to do a CLTS program. And my point is both of those things can be really good but only if you do them in places where they're really needed. And I think one of the ways to really challenge people is to say, what is the public health problem that you're trying to solve? Now, I was trained as a public health engineer, and when I was trained as a public health engineer, it was banged into my head over and over again that the point about public health engineering is you have to understand the environmental um, characteristics of the health problems you're trying to solve. So I read a lot, oh, hold on, we'll go back to that in a minute. I read a lot of the work of David Bradley and Richard Feacham and Duncan Mara and Graham Alabasta, who spent lots of time trying to classify health problems in terms of the environmental processes that promoted the spread or enabled you to manage the spread of those diseases. So there's lots of really useful work that's been done uh, classifying environmental, classifying disease groups not in terms of their, their, their sort of um, etiology, if you like, their sort of biology, but in terms of how they move through the environment. And for WASH people, that's really, really important. So I just picked out one. This is the environmental classification of excreta-related diseases uh, developed by Richard Feacham uh, in the 1970s. Um, and there are, I mean, depending on where you're working, you, you can think about this in terms of the whole universe of water-related diseases. These are specifically the excreta-related diseases. The first five of these are all excreted infections. And one of the reasons why I think this is particularly important at the moment is you know, I'm sure, that we're living in an era where, sadly, a succession of extremely well-designed, well-executed, and very, very expensive randomised control trials have successively proven that our sanitation intervention does not have a measurable health impact. And I think this is really dangerous, obviously, 
Because to me, the conclusion is not that sanitation doesn't have a health benefit. I really, really hope that people kind of buy the Jon Snow argument, and we know that that's not the case. But I think what we are proving is that incomplete sanitation interventions don't have health impacts. And the reasons for this are twofold. And here's the public health reason. The public health reason is that the ways in which people get sick, the, the, the organisms that make people sick, behave in a whole bunch of different interesting ways in the environment. So you might, be, you might have a, a, a population with a very high incidence of diarrheal disease in under fives. Most of those under fives are not suffering from a single... Um, disease, if you like. What they're doing is their systems are being constantly um, loaded, if you like, by a whole succession of infective agents, all of which have quite different characteristics. So, for example, um, they may be facing uh, viral and protozoan diseases. Now, viral and protozoan diseases um, are non-latent, don't have very long, they don't persist in the environment for very long but you only need to meet a very small number of viral infective agents to get sick. You can contrast that with bacterial infective agents, which last a little bit longer in the environment, but crucially can multiply. So if you excrete a whole load of viral and bacterial infective agents, and you don't want those viral agents to, and, and bacterial agents to meet the next person, from the viral point of view, we've got to stop immediate peridomestic transmission of those viral infective agents. So the intervention is likely to focus around improving water supplies and changing hygiene behaviours. But bacterial infective agents are really different. If that bacterial infective agent could happily find itself via the hands or by some other mechanism, popping into a nice dish of weaning food, for example, it'll be super happy. It'll multiply. It'll grow, and then the next opportunity it'll get, it will enter into another nice, cosy ecosystem, probably possessed by a child under the age of two who's consuming the weaning, the weaning food. So even if we've solved the hand-washing problem, if we haven't solved the food hygiene problem in that case, we're still going to see high rates of diarrheal infection in those um, potential, uh, what do you call that, um, hosts. So... One of the things that we have to, to sort of get people to think about, and we need WASH people to sort of understand the basics of this. Obviously, we don't need them all to become, you know, medical experts, but we need people to really be thinking about the physical characteristics of infective agents. So, you know, doctors generally will be thinking about the specific pathogens, the viruses, the bacteria, the protozoa, and the helminths. But what we want to really think about is the characteristics of these infective agents so we know how to tackle them. So what determines whether an excreted infection creates an, a, 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 an infection in a, in a secondary host? If I, if I have a big ship, what's going to, you know, how, how, how likely is that, that you, if you happen to live in my community, are also going to sit, get sick? Sorry, but, you know, someone has to, someone's going to get sick. Um, so what do we care about? We care about the excreted load. How many of the uh, infective agent do you produce every time you have a nice watery diarrhea? Um, we care about latency, so are they immediately infective or are they dormant in the environment for a certain amount of time? Are they persistent? Can they, can they exist outside their natural environment, which is your gut, for a short period or for a longer period of time? Can they multiply outside your gut? And then taking all of that, you end up with a certain amount of the infective agent out there in the environment. And then what we care about is how many of them do you have to meet in order to be likely to become infected. And there's a whole internal etiology, of course, which I've simplified here to infective dose. And then, of course, one of the other points we have to think about is how susceptible is the potential new host. So going back to my weaning foods argument, one of the reasons why weaning foods are such a very important kind of piece of the puzzle, I think, is because weaning foods are unless any of you have really, really weird habits, exclusively fed to children under the age of two who are extremely susceptible, as we know, particularly to bacterial infection. So it really matters how these infective agents are moving through the environment. And, and I think a better understanding of, of that will help people to ask much more critical questions about sanitation programs. So here's a table. Really, the details don't matter at all, but basically... This is my kind of like crib sheet for when I'm teaching my students. It's actually the answer sheet from an from a exam question that I set. It doesn't really matter. The point is 
that I'm trying to train people all the time. I'm trying to train people who primarily come from the public health engineering side to understand the likely ways in which infective agents are going to be functioning in the environment so that they can pick out critical interventions. So if you go into an environment where you can see that there's high rates of diarrheal disease, but if you really investigate what's going on, you find that primarily uh, most of those um, diarrheal diseases are associated with rotavirus, norovirus, or hep A, say, then you know immediately that one of the very, very critical things you must think about is how to control peridomestic communication of diseases in the house. And you're probably going to want to very quickly look at the quality, the quantity, the availability, and the reliability of water supply at home and the way in which that promotes or hinders uh, hyg hygiene behaviours at home. So it's the same thing in the UK. Winter vomiting, which is norovirus, you know, we care about people blowing their noses, we care about people washing their hands. We don't really care if people are shitting in the toilet or not, because really, if you excrete viruses and they stay on the ground or out in the environment, they're not really going to last very long. So that's not the transmission pathway that we really care about. In contrast, if you see high rates of Campylobacter or pathogenic E. coli or cholera, then you've really got to worry about food and water hygiene because those bacteria do like a nice Petri dish, as we know, and a weaning, bowl of weaning food is just a kind of, you know, superannuated Petri dish, really. Um, but here, that's when you really, really want to start getting people into, into the sort of mental state of sanitation. We've got to start keeping those bacteria out of the environment. We don't want them to reach the weaning food, basically. So if you have high levels of bacterial infections, then you might organize your intervention in a slightly different way. Now, I'm not saying that all these things aren't important all the time. They, obviously, ultimately, people have other reasons to want to have convenient, safe water supply, be practicing good hygiene and sanitation. But I think sometimes we really focus on one of the interventions for quite good reasons, and then we wonder why why we're not actually inter, inter, intervening to stop transmission along some of the other pathways. Uh, the one that I, two things that I want to really um, mention, I think one of them is uh, about bacterial fecal oral diseases and the other on, on geohelminthiasis, uh, worms primarily, which as you know are latent and exceedingly persistent in the environment. Now helminth infections are something that I care about a lot. That's my, everybody has a favorite disease, right? So I really love Ascaris, that's my thing. Sorry, schistosomiasis is really interesting, but you're dealing with that, so I'll do the worms. Um, worms are really tricky because worm eggs, as I'm sure you know, it's really, really hard to kill the little blighters. They persist, they persist. It's quite, you can heat them, you can dry them, you can store them, you can do all sorts of things to them, and they persist. One of the things that I think is really interesting that we neglect at our peril is the extent to which helminth infection passes through the what I would call the peri-urban food chain, particularly in urban areas. Huge problems with the reuse of wastewater that's not been appropriately treated and the reuse of sludges for agriculture, which is not managed in an appropriate way. Now, again, we have to be very cautious because I'm in no way saying that we shouldn't be reusing wastewater and sludges for agriculture. What I'm saying is we should be managing the resources that we produce in our sanitation systems appropriately according to whatever we're going to do with them in the field. And we should be managing what we do in the field appropriately according to whatever we're putting on the crops in order to irrigate them. So I mention this just to say I'm not obviously going to go into a huge amount of detail because I'm not going to talk for very much longer. So one message from the health community to the WASH community is please just make the acquaintance of your pathogenic uh, entities and their life cycles and pay attention. Just want to draw attention also, of course, to all of the other vector-borne diseases and the excreta-related vector-borne diseases, particularly filariasis. And this is where the very unfashionable, totally neglected and, you know, not cool at all sanitation intervention of drainage appears as a very important intervention. So I just mentioned that in case anyone here is a drainage nerd. You can come and talk to me afterwards. We have, you know, special groups like Alcoholics Anonymous for sad and depressed drainage people because uh, nobody wants to fund our stuff. Okay. Now, message for the wash people to give to the health people or the wash people to give to other wash people. So now you know that you want to sort out your sanitation. You know that you've got to capture the shit at home. You know you want people to practice good hygiene. You know you've got to worry about what's happening to the wastewater. You know you've got to worry about what's happening to the grey water and the um, 
uh, the effluent from those pesky septic tanks, which aren't septic tanks, which exist all over the world. You, now you know all of that. And you arrive in a city and someone says, yes, I get that. So how am I going to get all this shit out of the environment? And it's extraordinary. Here come those people again who say, oh, well, what I'm going to do for you is build you a sewer network or rehabilitate your sewer network or give you a load of septic tanks or make you all use ecosan toilets or whatever it is. And I'm a completely technology agnostic person. All those things are lovely, but only if we use them at the right place at the right time. So the one message that we all have to keep giving the WASH people is before you design your intervention, could we just actually find out where all the shit is coming from? It's extraordinary how infrequently this is done. So the world's a mess. Wherever you go to work, there's stuff happening. So first of all, there's always something already happening. So don't assume and don't let your young colleagues assume that they're going to turn up in Freetown and everybody's just going to be sitting there shitting in a bucket and waiting for you know, the gods of the wash sector to come and solve all their problems. People are doing stuff. Shit is moving around everywhere. There's markets for it. There's things happening. Farmers are buying and selling it. In some places, households are selling to farmers. In some places, farmers are buying from, you know, there's all sorts of things going on. The shit is on the move. So the first message is, make sure you know where the shit is and where it's coming from and where it's going to. Please, please, please don't forget that most of it in an urban place will be in the drains, and that's a really bad place for it. Um, it's not all about toilets. Quite often when I talk to people about that, they say, oh, yeah, we've done a situational analysis. We know all about it. We've done a household survey. We know what kind of toilets everyone has. Well, that is about 5% of the problem, especially in an urban system. It's not the toilet that's our problem, although there's an interesting piece of research that we've just finished in Nigeria that interestingly shows that in the particular region where we've been working, we get high rates of contamination and high rates of diarrhoeal disease only in the houses with toilets, but that's another story. Uh, so you need to, do need to know a little bit about what's going on with the toilets, but you also need to know what's going on with the rest of the shit. Now, I'm going to, with, I hope you'll indulge me because this is my little passion, but we use a, a tool called the shit flow diagram to do this. Now, I'm not saying you need to use shit flow diagrams, but what I'm saying is you need to be able to map how flows are going through the city, particularly in the drains, and particularly whether, they're com whether all the contamination is coming from the sludges, from the effluent, from on-site sanitation systems, or from sewers. So I just want to leave you with this, draw this diagram, which is a shit flow diagram for Hanoi, and it, it's, it's expressed in percentage household terms. And one of the things that's interesting about this, if you see at the top, there's about 12% of the city of Hanoi who have sewers. And for the last 20 years, the only sanitation plan in Hanoi has included the rehabilitation of sewage, sewerage, only. Ever since I've been working in Hanoi, in fact, I first went to work in Hanoi in 1993, and that's what the master plan said then, and that's what the master plan still says now. And the first step is always rehabilitation of the existing sewer network. If you rehabilitate the existing sewer network in Hanoi, you will move about 6% of the crap out of the environment into a system that works. And I can guarantee you that we will not see a downtick in health status. So, two messages. Tell nerdy wash people to learn a little bit about bugs and tell nerdy NTD people to learn a little bit about how shit flows, and then I think we'll all be in a really happy place. So good luck, have fun today, thank you very much. <laughs>